Jeff, as scientists, we're trained to ask how questions, what questions, but not really big why questions. That's, those are either impossible or left for philosophy or religion or other things like that. Um, but quantum mechanics, general relativity have so ch changed our perception of what reality is uh, that I like to ask why questions and force ourselves to think about it. Uh, so as a, a theoretical quantum physicist for a long time, your whole career, uh, when you reflect on the results that you get, some are very counterintuitive in quantum theory, uh, what does it make you reflect about the entire, entire existence? The whole show. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you know, the, uh, uh, the why questions are really the funnest questions, mm -hmm. right? Those are the ones that Actually, we ask as kids, the ones that really excite us, that really uh, inspire us about the nature of then science. Then we grow up and we're told not to, that well, we can't do it, and we terrible. forget it, it's embarrassing, we, yeah, we, that's it's sophomoric. A, that's a terrible you know, situation. I'm, I'm we not, shouldn't I'm allow not, that. I'm not embarrassed. Yeah, well, we should, we should let kids do that and in, actually inspire that even more. We should, the problem is that historically, you know, those are the hardest questions and very little progress has been made. But there are a few spectacular examples in which the big why questions were asked, the big philosophical why questions, and yet they were answered indeed um, using experimental and theoretical physics. So I guess I have a, a couple of examples of those which um, uh, we have great passion for. Uh, so one of those um, comes from the very theory of quantum mechanics, our most successful theory. Um, one of the big shifts, conceptual shifts, from the old classical theory, Newtonian physics, to the quantum mechanics, is it looked like just things happen for absolutely no reason, right? Just random things happen, and the interpretation of that is that nature is capricious. There's no reason for it to happen. And it was even deeper than that. People would think, oh, well, maybe we just don't understand. There's something hidden down there that we can't get, it, get to it. It turns out there were very deep reasons why it seemed like that was the you know, the best you could do, nature's capricious. We didn't accept that. We said there's some, why is it that nature seems to have this randomness? As Einstein would say, God playing dice. So we started tinker around with the big why questions at the axioms, the very deepest level of the theory, you know. Why did this universe get created in this way, that it has this structure of quantum mechanics? And for us, the deep axioms that to us looked like were important, was this notion of non-locality. This is at the deepest level. And also causality. You know, there's nature respects cause-effect relationships. And so uh, we started to try to understand non-locality deeper. And lo and behold, we started to discover all kinds of new, deep kinds of non-locality. And uh, what we furthermore discovered, even though all these various different kinds of non-locality, they worked together in a very strange way. In some sense, they didn't seem to have much to do with each other other than being non-locality. But they always, it looked like those non-localities should violate the notion of causality, right? It should be, you know, mm. that's kind of what non-locality yeah, is. Right. It connects distant points, you know. Instantaneously. Instant, seemingly instantaneously, yeah. or you can wave your hammer over here and something way over there gets hit with the hammer even though they're not in the same location. Things like this happen. Um, and so what we discovered was that um, it turns out that the only way you could have these different principles live together, these seemingly mutually exclusive principles, they shouldn't play well together. The only way you get these deep principles to work together is if you have this playing of dice. So it, 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 we were able to show that the, the seeming capriciousness, the seeming playing of dice was sort of emergent, was a consequence of having these deeper principles of non-locality mm -hmm. and causality. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, the beautiful thing is that we, we um, you know, we didn't have this depressing situation. Everybody said, you know, we had this beautiful classical physics. We knew the state of the universe now. We could exactly predict the state of the universe later. And then, you know, who ordered uncertainty? That screwed yeah. everything up. Now we have, we see that the positive, something beautiful hides behind what was normally thought to be negative, and that we get all of these rich new structures of, of, of uh, 
of physics that have been coming out of the woodwork. One example, you know, the, the famous uh, double slit experiment. Probably you've heard of that. Everybody, yeah. Feynman said this is the this is the heart of the mystery of quantum mechanics. This is the one thing that nobody understands. And if you got him over a beer, I was a student of his, but if you got him over a beer, he'd say nobody will ever understand it. Yeah. You know, I was a teenager at the time, so yeah. I kind of, in rebellious fashion, I said, oh yeah, I'll try to understand it. So we were able to use this, a new kind of non-locality to answer the big double slit question. If we, if you think of a particle going through these two slits. How is it that a particle going to the right slit knows whether or not the left slit is open or closed? Mm -hmm. And it turns out it has a non-local interaction, the electron over here with the slit over there, it just knows, even though there's, you know, it shouldn't be able to interact with it. And so we were able to solve a lot of those ancient So the fact that non-locality has been proven and alternative explanations almost always disproven, what, what does that say about the nature of reality? Ah, well, um, Ah, it, it shows that, uh, that, that, that nature is spectacularly non-local. It shows that the usual way we experience our life uh, on our macroscopic level, which is very local, right? We, 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 yeah. Everything looks like a you know, Lego block, splice and dice, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and we we're also able to prove that there's a kind of complementarity between the non-local non and the local. So as you kind of get more into one, you get less of the other. We're, we're obviously at the other extreme of the local. Very good way of doing science. But I would say that uh, the implications, and this is just all very new, the implications of this much richer, deeper non-locality are, are immense. We have immense implications for new technology, immense implications for our basic understanding of ourselves.